I think we're live. <laughs> I think we did it. I think we're live. Right. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, Anisha and I are thrilled to have panelists, have all of our attendees here. This is our 50th episode of Be Real, the podcast that we started the week we went shelter in place. So we were on a roll to start it and we just we just kept on doing it because we just kept on doing it. Um, so tonight we have a very special conversation, one that is very dear to Adisha and I and to the panelists in the room. And we are going to be talking about um, anti-racism from the business perspective and also from in the room as clinicians. And I do want to make a note that, uh, and Anisha knows this, when we were trying to when we were um, advertising for this event, we it was right around the election. We were putting things out. And first we put out the, when we put it out as an ad, it was rejected because it said anti-racism in the ad because of whatever, whatever Facebook was. And then we redid it and we redid it as culture, race, and identity. And that bounced back. And then we finally came up with language around cultural competency that was watered down enough for Facebook and Instagram to be able to uh, tolerate. So um, this was how we knew we were in the right place and having the conversation at the right time because it is uh, very important. So, Anisha. I am excited that this is our 50th episode. I can't believe it. To start this in a pandemic um, was super hard just kind of dealing with having to be home all day, every day, not knowing what was next. But I knew every Friday afternoon we would be doing this. And it's so interesting how Diane and I got so much closer because we were spending yeah. all of this extra time together and it's kind of been amazing. So I just am so grateful that all of you guys are here um, to have this really important conversation. So thank you so much. Um, Diana, do you want to, I guess we should just let everyone go around and introduce themselves, can we start that way? Uh, yeah, where are you gonna start? <laughs> um, so why don't we start with Dr. Natalie? Sure, um, do you want me to just say my name or a little bit more about myself? A little bit, let's tell the tell everybody who you are, a little bit about yourself. Sure, so I I'm- been, I've been having an intimate relationship with you all because <laughs> you've been in my ear, so everybody else yeah. should know. <laughs> Oh, the beauty of webinars and podcasts. Um, so I'm Dr. Natalie Edmond. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and uh, yoga teacher. Uh, I'm located in central New Jersey um, in Mercer County. And um, I own a group practice in Ewing, New Jersey called Mindful and Multicultural Counseling. And I'm also an anti-racism consultant. Uh, I facilitate a lot of anti-racism workshops and just um, workshops around racial trauma and building cultural competence and just how do we have more intimate relationships and be able to talk about race and other identities? So I'm excited to be here with all of you to dive deeper into this much needed topic. Veronica. Oh, okay, sorry. I'm oh, you're just gonna call on us or go in order. Okay, hi, Veronica. I'm licensed clinical social worker. Um, it's hard, I'm hearing my voice in the back, so it's throwing off my stuff, but I'll try to work. Um, co-founder and director of Java Therapy Group, and uh, we offer clinical services to individuals through family psychotherapy um, with all Midtown Manhattan and the Bronx. And we also are providers of continuing education. So we have a um, continuing education program that's been in operation for, I think, at least three years now. Um, and uh, it's is something that's near and dear to my heart, the labor of love, um, because I really believe firmly in the power of activity of professional growth and self-exploration and reflecting as professionals and how that can deepen our practice with clients. Um, and I don't know what else, what else did I say. I think that's about it. I, I think going. that's a lot. I, 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 I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Carrie? Sure. So I'm Carrie Moore. I'm a licensed clinical social worker um, and also a therapist. And I run a group practice called A Good Place Therapy and Consulting. 
Uh, we're located downtown Manhattan, and we work mostly with adults and couples, although we're expanding um, and have expanded recently into serving more kids, um, teens, and also working with families. And um, we've been uh, you know, immersed in our own anti-racism work as a practice um, and really trying to do um, everything that we can uh, to unlearn the racism and um, really understand our place with uh, you know, white supremacy. And um, I'm really excited to be here in, in conversation with you all to do that. And Lyrica? Hi, everyone. My name is Lyrica Fize May. I am a licensed clinical social worker and registered play therapist. I work with Veronica at Bava Therapy Group, and I've been a CU trainer there for, I think, the last three years. And we have an anti racist or a racial literacy group that we're doing monthly. And I also work many, most days of the week at the New York City Department of Education as a director of equity transformation and culturally responsive environments. It's like the longest title ever. And yeah. Um, that is a very impressive title though. I like it. <laughs> I didn't even know that they had, well, it's also good to know because I didn't actually know that they had that um, title at the DOE. So that's wonderful news. Um, okay, so thank you so much, ladies. And again, I'm super excited to have you all. Um, we're going to start the conversation with Dr. Natalie, because as I mentioned, she's been intimately in my ears. So I recently listened to a training that she gives to group practice owners um, and businesses and all about, I, it was on a group practice podcast, which is why I'm identifying it that way, about uh, anti-racism. And I was really struck uh, when you got, and you can start anywhere in the conversation. Um, my personally, personal takeaway was, I really like the way that you broke down the four different categories of businesses. Um, and, uh, it was very, I, I think when we got, like, I got, I understood the first two and I got, I, when we got to diversity and anti-racism, I was like, oh, oh, okay. There's some big differences there. So um, wherever you want to start about your work and what you do, but please. Sure. Um, so I would say my anti-racism work is uh, I do some for group practices who want to, uh, either they're all white practices or predominantly white practices who want to explore their whiteness and, um, want to be um, more anti-racist in the ways that they communicate with each other and the community and, and clients. And then I work with group practice owners around business coaching and just like, how do you lead from this anti-racist lens? And then I do like community workshops, just like people who just want to explore this kind of stuff in a safe space. So one of the things I really like is looking at what's the culture of an organization. So whether you're a small business or a big business, a therapy practice or some other kind of business is looking at that there are four main types of businesses. So when you when we look at it from a racial lens, so on the one end of the continuum would be kind of the traditional all white club. Right. And so um, if we look like in history towards like the colonizer, we think of all white club as being, you know, all white, cis, male, probably heterosexual, upper class educated. Um, and so a lot of that is very much a top down hierarchy. And so the power is, is held in that all white club. Uh, and even if we see over time as, you know, um, female presenting individuals have gained more rights. Um, so it might be an all female club, but it might still be predominantly white. And um, when we look at those kind of businesses, um, they tend to be in, in pretty white neighborhoods, probably more suburban. Um, there's kind of a particular way that it's the business is decorated that really centers whiteness. And it's kind of just the standard that you know we were used to for a really long time. Then the next category would be kind of token or affirmative action. So it's where you start to, um, there's starts to be more assimilation and you start to see more black indigenous or people of color um, who are also working in these roles but they tend to not have a lot of power um, and the power is really at the top and still pretty hierarchical so even though you have more BIPOC individuals in the organization the culture really doesn't change it's really about how do you assimilate into a predominantly white space 
and race is not really talked about. And there's a lot of desire for like conformity. And then um, the last two categories can be kind of confusing. Uh, so the third category would be a multicultural business, multicultural organization. So uh, there's more BIPOC individuals in that business. There's some experimentation with like, maybe we can not be so top down, so hierarchical. Um, you might even start to see more BIPOC people in leadership roles. Um, the, the office decor might better represent what's happening in the community. Uh, even if you look at like, um, like what is the funding or is it self-pay or insurance based, some of that stuff starts to, starts to change. And there's more of a sense like we should start talking about racism, but there's, it's still pretty conflict avoidant in those organizations. And then at the other end would be, the fourth category would be anti-racist. And so that is a really an active practice of trying to dismantle white supremacy, to um, work against uh, racist policies and ideas, this idea that like, let's start to look at neurodiversity and maybe employees work differently and have different styles and how do we accommodate that? Um, how, how does where we live or where our business lives reflect the community we actually want to serve? Does our staff match the community we're trying to serve? Or do we allow for a sliding scale or insurance or some way that a wide variety of people can access the services we offer? And there's active like discussion around race and oppression and other ways in which identities can be marginalized. Assimilation is not um, the standard. It's more about inclusion and that we have to adapt everything we do in order to fit that. So, that uh, would be like the example of the four different organizations. And for me, it's helpful to think about that because even when I look at my own businesses, like it's an active practice to be anti-racist, even though that when I founded it, that's what I wanted it to be. But we're so socialized into kind of white supremacy culture that it's hard to, it takes much longer, right? And, and white supremacy is about perfection and urgency. And so how do we challenge some of those systems? Um, thank you, because, and I, I know as a business owner, when I was hearing the, just the nuances between multicultural and diversity and anti-racist, and you're right, like the, in my mind, it was always an anti-racist establishment, but where is, where are we being influenced? It really, really, really made me think, like, where are we being influenced? in the organization, like what other things do we need to bring in to make sure that we are having more active conversations um, and more awareness on my part as, as the owner of the business and just like making sure that I am actively in the conversation all the time. It's a lot, it's, it, it, was, it was very eye-opening in the way that you put it. I liked, I liked it a lot. Um, but I'm not the only group practice owner here. So how are you guys, Carrie or uh, Veronica, how, how are you guys doing with with the that nuance in there? Um, you know, I don't know. I don't, I'm having a hard time. I'm hearing myself to back. So I don't want to, um, I don't, I, I see the timing of the video is off. Oh, I can hear you now. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I found it very illuminating to hear broken down into those categories. As you were speaking, I was thinking about the different work environments that I had worked in prior to being in the practice that we're in now. Um, and I had formal lives in finance and public relations in a male dominated environment, female dominated environment, and now into a into social social work and clinics I work in the practice that we're in now with um you know it's interesting i would think and there can you help me with this we would fall more being more i guess multicultural in our practice in terms of our our therapist and stuff and um i feel like a lot of how we went about growing our practice and building our team was based on qualities of the person 
oftentimes we would interview our therapist. I never saw pictures or, or it was like, I want to talk to the person. I want to see the skills. I want to get a sense of who you are, who your voice. And it's just, we went about the quality of the person without being intentionally anti-racist or intentionally multicultural. Um, and sort of that's where we landed. Okay. I don't know if I can send to that, but here we've got some nuances of the different categories. Um, just help me reflect on where we are and how we do and what we reflect with how intentionally trying to do so. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yep. I want to echo that too, because like I, I look at, that was a really helpful frame, Natalie, and I was looking at um, our process as where we're at, and I was feeling like a little ouch when you talked about the all-white club, because I felt like there was a, a period of time when I was building the practice that my practice reflected that, and and then being a practice in a you know diverse city like New York and downtown Manhattan, you know that really is not acceptable. And um, I found it also to be like a reflection of a lot of what I saw in my career in different nonprofit settings where um, in nonprofit leadership I was able to you know easily hire uh, people of color into many different positions and management positions as long as they weren't the clinical social work positions. And then I had certain um, positions and community organizations that were, you know, Medicaid funded in particular um, that required LCSW um, or cl clinician. And then I would only be getting uh, resumes from white social workers. And then, um, you know, before you know it, I had, you know, a social work department that was all white in a very diverse, uh, large organization with multiple programs um, where it was very diverse and where there were many people of color across all positions. And so I've, I've struggled with um, seeing how white the institution of social work is and the ironies that are embedded in that because, you know, we're really social work is supposed to be about, you know, person in the environment and representation. And there are real systematic barriers to you know, people of color entering the field and to completing internships and I'm jumping through, you know, all the things that are required and so I looked at that as a systemic problem, and I, I have seen that throughout my career. But I think in my practice, I also used it as a crutch and as an excuse, and um, would kind of find myself just replicating the same patterns, um, not doing as much work as I should have earlier on to really not hire another person until I could hire a person of color. And um, you know, I felt like we paid the price of that when. Um, when George Floyd was killed, and there was a, you know, galvanizing across the board for what uh, we needed to do as a practice, as individuals, as a profession, um, as you know, clinical leaders in the community, and that we're supposed to be responsible for healing, and um, it was painful. <laughs> so you know, we went from probably being somewhere in between two, maybe two. I would give myself maybe the second tier. <laughs> you know, um, back in May to you know, where we're at now, which is more actively striving towards the anti-racism. So I think, um, you know, for me, I, you know, I kept been like this mantra about there's um, no growth without discomfort. That was very real for me. <laughs> but it still is like very real in the process. Like it, it is, a, you know, a, like a raw space, but a necessary kind of space to be in. I agree with you that it just, um it's really hard, right? I think um, if we look at like just the social work or counselor or psychology profession, there's a small percentage that, that are BIPOC identifying individuals who even get degrees and get licensed. So it's a very small pool that you're trying to recruit from. Mm -hmm. And so I think for myself, I, I kind of the standard that I've tried to hold for myself is, you know, can I have 30% of my staff be BIPOC identifying? And um, what are some of the barriers to that? Like sometimes that means that I mentor people earlier in the field um, who maybe don't have as many of the bells and whistles or enough enough training, like in terms of like advanced training. And so I, I just like will spend the time mentoring them and helping them grow within the organization. Um, but also thinking about uh, my practice uh, treats a high number of BIPOC individuals um, is that how do I train my white clinicians to be able to hold the space 
for BIPOC clients? Because some BIPOC clients only want to work with people who look like them, but others just want culturally competent therapists who have done their own inner work and are able to hold the space for them to, to bring their full selves into the therapy room. So finding that, that balance of both. Mm -hmm. The other piece on that, that kind of a back, is when one of our BIPOC therapists had a client who's white and express sort of discomfort or there's that come up. Yeah. No. Right. Uh, yeah, I think there's some things to consider, right? Like social work started out uh, helping poor white people. It has never really been designed to to help BIPOC people. And so we're and Natalie, you you, you said this earlier that like white dominant culture is the kind of the air that we breathe. Like we're breathing that in constantly. And so when we look at organizations that are all white, we don't necessarily have a negative reaction to that. And we can be in New York City, which is like the most diverse city, I don't know, maybe in the world, but definitely in the country. And um, we, it's, it's also very, very segregated, right, at the same time. And one thing I have been talking to uh, a, an organization in Chicago that I think does this work better than a lot of organizations in New York is that some BIPOC folks are even terminating with white clients who have caused harm to them. So the clinician is a BIPOC identifying the, the client causes harm and they are even terminating those, those clients. And like sometimes we, I, I tell somebody that and that sounds outrageous, but the truth is that like to be a BIPOC clinician and be putting all your work into someone and then hear their true views on your actual value of your life can be it can be extremely painful and should almost be you should almost be charged extra for something like that and so there's just so much work yeah. to do in in that kind of in that kind of work and we have a long way to go to keep keep unlearning everything we've learned um i love that policy at, in chicago they should be discharged or charged more for sure. Um, most certainly as an experience of a therapy, it's a therapeutic experience too for them, for that person. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, and you do, and also uh, Dr. Natalie, you bring up a really good point. And this is something that I, Anisha and I were talking about earlier uh, is the, the white clinician is that there are, if we have 30% of the population in our field are BIPOC identified, and then the really training the white clinicians on how to be as open and love, all the things, I was gonna say loving because it's the first word I could think of, but like how we bring that into the room and how we also then um, have the patient or client really under like trust that therapist. Cause I do know that now like I have, we have a very similar, I mean, Anisha is probably the busiest therapist I know right now. So, but she can't see everybody. So how are we gonna, and if like, and then if we have a white clinician, they don't, they don't wanna go. So where, where that, where that, um, education is for the therapist more so than the client and then how do we make that initial introduction in the room so that the client feels safe is really um this yes ma'am yeah. <laughs> yeah i was just thinking about when we get our training in social work school and other spaces that we get training there's not a lot of training around racial-based trauma Right. So as clinicians, we know how to come in a room and we know how to talk to someone about sexual abuse, addiction, childhood trauma. But we don't talk about racial trauma. Right. And I feel like as a BIPOC clinician, um, I had to do a lot of work with myself around that and what that meant for me. And how do I just kind of recognize that in someone and kind of sit with it and validate the feeling instead of try and fix it, too. Right. Because sometimes there's that fix it thing in us. And I just had to kind of sit with it. But we've never been trained. 
white clinicians, BIPOC clinicians, we haven't been trained around racial trauma in that way. It's like, it's a bad word. It's like a word you shouldn't bring in the room. And I remember after George Floyd uh, at Be Well, we actually had a meeting and um, I was very transparent and I was very vulnerable. And I went on there and I, and I was crying and I was in tears and I was just like, I'm in pain, right? And so for all the other clinicians, if you have any BIPOC clients, they are in pain too. And you have to talk about it. You can't act as if it's not happening because, you know, getting on Zooms when you had just been crying somewhere in the closet and then you have to kind of present yourself as if everything is okay, it's painful. And so I was urging white clinicians, you know, at the practice, talk about it, bring it into the room. Because what, as, a, as another BIPOC person and I'm in therapy as well, I'm thinking if you don't talk about it, then you don't see me because you know it's affecting me. It's all over the news. How can it not be affecting me? But I do believe that it's just not within our training. And that's where the misstep happens from the beginning when we're trained as clinicians. Why are we not talking about racial trauma in the way that we're talking about other traumas? And why aren't we also talking about our own racial identity? Yes. You know, and, um, I, I found this to be eye-opening when I was um, studying at Ackerman last year because it's a real practice to really start with your social locators and to do that with clients, you know, present in the room. And it's like an acknowledgement of this is what informs who I am with you in the room, because I'm not going to pretend that I'm a blank slate, you know, or I'm, I'm just like a sponge absorbing what you have to tell me. Like ev everything about who we are informs our interventions in terms of you. And um, I find I was shocked at how difficult some parts of my identity um, that were hard to explore. And then now I'm, I'm really striving to do this with our team and some of our active anti-racism work. It starts with, you know, who are you? How do you identify? What is your racial identity, you know, as a clinician? And um, it's a really good starting place to with white clients around racism and, and doing all the work to explore the ways that we're all impacted by white supremacy and patriarchy. Like how do we kind of fit into this the way that this is just kind of baked into our lives and we're all living under these oppressive uh, structures. And we have to constantly, I think, Carrie, what you said is so important. We have to constantly be acknowledging it. Like I have to always, when I'm working with black individuals, darker skin than me, I always have to acknowledge like I'm light skin. I don't know what it feels like to be, feel unsafe on, on the street um, at any given moment. Like I just, I'm, I'm black, but I'm light skin and there's a difference. And so as I'm validating their feelings, I have to, I have to bring it up again, even if I've already brought it up in every other session, uh, because, and we're not used to that. We aren't trained in that. We think it's weird. We think we're being awkward or making a big deal, but we're actually giving permission in a situation where we're holding the power as the therapist, as the person who's billing insurance, as the person who's doing a diagnosis, we're hold the power. And we have to acknowledge where we stand and what we see when 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 we're working with people. The other question that I really like to ask is like, how much did race play a part in this? You know, if a client ha is dealing with something with a supervisor, you know, just asking what's what was the race of the supervisor? How much does race play a part in it? And they might say nothing. You know, I don't think race is an issue here, but just acknowledging it on my part is is extremely important. That that I see you, right? And I see your skin color and that it's important to me and that I value you. It seems like the first challenge is uh, challenging colorblindness, right? Which is, I think, that culture of politeness and how people haven't built the muscle to talk about race, right? So what I notice a lot in um, the various trainings I run is like the, the paralysis that a lot of white embodying white presenting individuals have is they understand that they need to do something but they don't have the vocabulary they haven't done enough of the work and it's really uncomfortable to hold that space i taught this graduate course in the fall called um, multiculturalism and feminism and it was for first year um, doctoral counseling students and um, they had taken they had each had master's degrees and they had taken a multicultural class in their master's program um, but it was much more focused on cultural competence and not so much on cultural humility and definitely not anti-racism. And so you could see how 
painful it was for the white presenting students. Like it was so painful for them to talk about all of these different identities and to really explore their whiteness. Um, they grew tremendously by the end of the semester, um, but you could see them wrestling with it. You could see the fragility, you could see the defensiveness. Uh, I even had a, a student in the class say, um, like halfway through the semester that she was in her own therapy and she was talking to her white therapist and the therapist was, who was a seasoned therapist said, yeah, I don't take any of the multicultural continuing education classes. I just don't treat BIPOC people. And, and so my student was like, I want to be like that too. I just want to avoid all of this because I feel so uncomfortable. Okay. And she was able to stay with it. And by the end of the yeah. semester, she did this amazing immersion project on um, African-American um, population and she had grown so tremendously. So I think we're doing a disservice to so many um, counselors out there and therapists out there of not having them really sit in this discomfort in a in a space where that allows you to be messy and to, to have racist ideas. And how could you not have racist ideas having lived in this country for any amount of time? The point is not to not have racist ideas, but to become aware of it and then start to dismantle and challenge that and then become anti-racist. Mm -hmm. um, the term cultural humility, I am going to, I'm going to put it everywhere because I think that for me, I've been thinking about the one cultural competency class that you get in social work school because there's one in your second semester or your first semester, there's just the one. Mm -hmm. And um, there is no there. And when I think back on it, there was no humility then. There was just it was a paper you wrote. You, you, you could identify like when you were doing your biopsychosocial or whatever the case may be. And like that was it. You didn't have to you didn't have to identify your whiteness in the room. And I went to I mean, I went to NYU. The, my, the room that I was in was all white with the exception of the professor. And there were, it was, there wasn't that space. And um, I would let the education itself does need to change. I think when we are set, when we are let out into the world to train people, to work, sit with people and sit with people's feelings and discomfort and your own feelings and discomfort, I think that that is where, um, where we really, where we, where we should really start. And I know my all of my postgraduate training is in psychoanalysis, which so that cultural competency class was white, but that so that psychoanalysis is just they they're like still trying to figure it out over there. I'm watching them sort of panic. Uh, cuz the whole training is not to talk about, it, not to identify that you are even in the room. And I'm like, oh, but that doesn't make it. You have to talk about it. You do in and so not, many different ways. It's almost like it's not integrated. It's like look at this, like this other separate thing that you do. You take cultural competency class, like you earn that CEU. But I think a lot yeah. of clinicians, like your student was that's such a wonderful example of how she talked about bringing that to her therapist and her therapist saying, I don't see that as relevant you know, for my practice. But I think um, for me early on, a big battle of you know, the journey is how do we really ensure that everybody sees and understands how integrative this is to our practice as clinicians, that it's everything about what we do and that it's not separate because it's who we are. And you know, who are we as therapists yeah. or clinicians if we're not talking about the core of who we are? You know, so it, it just, right. so we, I was so lucky to find this wonderful um, clinician, Dr. Melba Sullivan, who's been um, I don't know if anyone knows her, has worked with her, but um, she's been guiding us on the journey and, and really kind of helping us with that. And, you know, my, my hopes and getting feedback from the team is that we're um, integrating it, you know, completely and kind of doing, doing that work. So well, since we're talking about um, courses, Erica, can you kind of give us an overview of the racial literacy courses that you've created for individual therapists? And um, yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So we have um, different, they're not coming to my mind right now. Why is that? Okay. Well, there's one on ancestral um, trauma, resilience, and wisdom. Like one thing that we always talk about in terms of BIPOC people is, you know, here's our history and there's, and we have trauma and we have generational trauma and we need to understand that. Actually, we don't always talk about that, but sometimes we talk about that. And then 
we never really talk about the resilience that exists from people who have survived genocides and slavery. And there's a lot of ways that people did um, or, and do uh, work through what has been left out of that. So that is one. We, are, we have one called Impact Versus Intent, Decolonizing Therapy, which we just sort of reworked. And uh, that one is really about, you know, what are the rules that are a part of therapy that we just, we just follow like they've been they've been these ancient rules like sessions are 45 minutes or 50 minutes right like who decided that like does that work for all groups um there's a, a big movement now to change the way that therapy is really focused on the individual because if we look at white dominant culture individualism is a huge part of white dominant culture and maybe we need to do more um, either groups or bring in more people into the therapy, mix it up, not always do individual therapy. Um, so just really looking at the different rules that we that we participate in in therapy or even around um, self-disclosure. You know, if you're a white clinician and you have a BIPOC um, client, like how is self -dis not just self-disclosing actually harmful perhaps, right? And in what ways is that just maintaining an imbalance of power? Um, we have another, or Veronica, what, which ones am I missing? Oh yeah. So the implicit bias, that's where we start. Um, yeah. implicit bias, um, gets a, a bad rap in terms of not being able to necessarily change people's minds. But if you pair it with, or if, if you get that, use that as a foundation, um, that can get people to have the same common language, understanding, you know, that as, as we all have brains that we have bias and so i think that one's actually really important also for clinicians because as social workers or mental health practitioners we think we we kind of wear this badge of armor as being like we have empathy like you know you know my sister will always say like you're a terrible therapist like how can you call me that name right um i'm not a therapist in every moment and so while like with my clients i might do a great job like i in the real world i can still cause a lot of harm right and so we have to just understand these concepts and it provides a really good foundation for that. Um, and then we did one, like, how did we get here? So really going through the history of the United States and looking at the genocide, the impacts of slavery and um, Jim Crow and like all the, you know, black people in this country have been enslaved longer than, than they've been free. And so we really need to look at the history that we didn't learn in school because we didn't learn, we didn't know what he really learned great history. Um, unless you got history from outside of your regular education in school. And so we need to relearn and do better as we move forward. So those are some of our, yeah. our workshops. Yeah. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure where to start on the workshops. No, I was it's a lot. Time, I was I was back. I'm back at like the decolonizing and the 45 minute session and bringing more people into the room. And suddenly my head went like, oh, oh, oh my goodness! Like that, like right, like. And I probably wouldn't have thought about that because that. I mean, I am like very. And I'm very trained in that, like, I stand up at 45 minutes and I'm like, thank you. And my patients lie down. I mean, like, I do that. So it is um, it is very interesting to, and uh, like, I got, I got a little nervous <laughs> in that I was like, oh, okay. But like, it is, it's so also relieving to hear, right? Like that there can be a different way and that there are different ways and that there are different ways to treat people. And that um, we are, that there, that you are out there uh, telling, like really examining it and that there is that opportunity to, um, to be different and um, let more feelings out and be bigger containers. And yes, and also that we're not therapists 24 hours a day. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, but what seems so, I think, powerful is that, that it, you know, we've had such a wide uh, attendance and participation in these classes, which while there has been um, such a hesitancy to talk about, and it's really right to your point, and you said earlier about racial trauma, how that's not part of our training. And I remember a cultural competency class at, or a multicultural competency class at NYU. Um, and it was more just 
not like a graph of all the different cultures and what you can learn about different people. But yeah, there is not the experiential piece that we need, which is what have I been in my history growing up in the world that I lived in, that I was born to, and what am I carrying into the room, whether I know it or not. And it's that piece of, you know, what I think I might know and what I might not know. And it's that part that we get afraid of and we're, we can tend to be hesitant because we don't want to insult, we don't want to be injured, we might not know. And, and to your point, Dr. Natalie, about learning the language and learning the word and, and learning how to attend to these, these issues that are real and valid and important and necessary, especially if we're in the position of trying to help people sit with the discomfort, we still have to sit with our discomfort. And so through the, uh, the racial literacy series that America's been teaching, the feedback has consistently been, this is amazing, this, there's so much my head is doing, what do I do with it? And so that's why, you know, Lyric actually said, I think we need to switch up the next class and make it more, you know, how do we get into the room of the world experience, right? And that's part of why we, there is such a hunger, you know, and I think it's a growing hunger for doing this work as clinicians, which hopefully then we do more of it, we can spread it out wide and share the wealth of the work, so to speak, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm getting little side notes over here on how people can t have access to your courses, ladies. So I just wanted you all to know that, like, when we when we put this out again, because it will show up uh, in, as a podcast, and we will make sure that all of the information and how to connect to uh, all of this wonderful information is in the show notes, and it will also go out in an email to everybody who. Uh, registered for the class. I'm like, okay, we're signing you all up. I can't, it's amazing. Um, I mean, I'm taking so many notes over here that I'm like, I'm not 100% sure where to, where to go next. <laughs> I think I know where I would like to go really quick. Please. Um, because the term anti-racist, it feels like it's a very new term to me personally. I'm not sure to everyone else on the panel. Um, but my thought is that with this push for anti-racism in the therapeutic community, like, will it last? Or will it be something that will, like, kind of die down when it's no longer popular, right? Like, so when everyone is finished kind of taking their trainings, are we kind of just going to let it go to the wayside? Do you guys think that this is something that will actually last, even when it's not popular to talk about anymore? I think a shift is happening. I think you can't undo the shift that's happening, okay. mm -hmm. right? But I also think we're in a, a window of time where we have to try to do as much as we can to build the roots and mm -hmm. the foundation. Um, I mean, I was doing anti-racism trainings before George Floyd's murder, but I do so many more since his murder, right? right. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so I think that I, the way I think about it, the more people are examining their own racial identity and their relationship to white supremacy and the harm they've done and what they've internalized, the more that that lasts, right? And there will be people who are more performative, who um, like, you know, get through their guilt or their shame and decide to like opt out. But I think mm -hmm. that there will be some like significant things that change. Like I think the ways in which like, I think we can't unsee what we saw in 2020. Um, and I think we'll go from that momentum. And I think like there are moments of time, like kind of like with the civil rights movement, right? Like there was a large push and then we went back into like color blindness. But like there, you can't challenge the fact that there was significant change that happened in the 60s. And so I feel like we're in this other time of reckoning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking of something uh, similar, Dr. Natalie, like w this is a movement, but there's been many more movements before this. And so while, you know, I think the pandemic allowed um, sort of a microscope on George Floyd's mur murder, he was not the first one to be murdered. And, um, you know, I think that there's a long way to go. Like this is, white supremacy is in every single institution and things, 
honestly need to be dismantled, taken apart. There's a long way to go to do that. Like it takes a lot of work and it is, it's awful. I always say to people like equity work kind of sucks. Like you have to feel really uncomfortable. You have to get called in and called out and it sucks. Like it's not an enjoyable thing. And, and we know this as like doing workshops, you have to, it's a different kind of like pulling yourself to the, to the, now to the computer. It's a different experience than just having a meeting or having a session. Like anti-racist work is, you know, we're, we're always learning together in it. You can't really be an expert. And so, cause there's always more to learn and it's just kind of, it can be awful. Right. And so I think, um, while we all want to do it and like we want to stay in it it's very important to acknowledge and validate like this is not that fun to talk about how you know i'm being treated or how you know and and be maybe sometimes i don't know what the word is devalidated like unvalidated about my experience and to maybe argue or like wrestle over a topic that nobody wants to talk about you know and so i think we have a long way to go and i don't know if it might fizzle out in some places, but some people are going to keep doing the work and, and then something else will happen and we'll get another movement again. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's so uncomfortable and so needed. And I think what I was on at the very beginning of the pandemic and right, I think it was like three days after George Floyd was killed. I was on a different, in a out, outside of the therapeutic space, I was on a different call. And there was a woman on the call and she was like, I've never seen anything. She was just like, the portal is open. And it's like, the portal is open and we have to keep doing it. And it was just such a great image of like, we're gonna keep doing the work and we're gonna do the, and we're gonna get messy and be uncomfortable and keep going through the portal and keep working. And Carrie, I think I cut you off. <laughs> we're gonna say something. We started talking at the same time. <laughs> um, yeah, for, for us and our, our work with Dr. Sullivan, it's been a lot about kind of building our capacity and using this, this frame of the, a window of tolerance. And I think it's it's just necessary to be able to realize that we do have the capacity more than we think to be in the messiness and to do the work and also to kind of handle, you know, the triggers that come up because not everybody is in the place where they can do the work. and. It's not convenient, especially for people who hold positions of power and who, for whom like white supremacy really serves. And I'm not saying that without looking at myself, but um, for me, it'll come up like, you know, politically, like when um, Mike Pence was on the debate stage, I don't know if, if uh, any of you tuned into the vice president debates, but he actually said like, quote unquote, there's no such thing as institutional racism. And for me, I feel like I, it just is like, rage and then how do you channel that <laughs> rage because the way that i learned to do that was this is a a really functional survival skill that he has to maintain this this powerful position and the people he needs to speak to in the audience to hear that and um it's functional in that way and not everybody's going to see it and it just means that you know we have to work harder and we have to you know channel the energy mm -hmm. that kind of comes from that and by and then making sure that we see it clearly and that we don't see ourselves as exempt from it. We just say, oh, I can see why he does that because it's so hard because he, he holds as much power and it's really inconvenient to look at the ways that history has um, built racist institutions to benefit you as a white man, you know, or us as white people, you know? So, so for me, it's been um, always kind of going back to myself and, and she's doing a lot of somatic work, you know, really like inner, just, working in our bodies, feeling where it comes up, like knowing where that is, like being able to say, I can drop into this, I can continue the work and so I can keep doing it and it can be sustainable. Yeah. I, I think one thing I continue to struggle with around this is um, recognizing the peace, that fear of difference, the underlying fear of difference and the kind of clinging that happens to sameness or whiteness, likeness. And like, it's great to do the work with when there's people who want to do the work, right? Yeah. And who are interested in willing, ready, wanting to see the discomfort grow. And there's 
cares is how many people that we are learning to coexist with and we how we need to coexist with who are not interested in doing the work. And that's what scares me as a human being in this world. And that's what I keep asking and thinking, how do we do this? How do we reach people who, who don't want to be reached, aren't interested in being reached? Because that force is strong and that's going to be there. And that's based on a lot of, you know, primal fear, primal sense of power. There's a lot. I know that's like another conversation. But that's what I kind of have to I'm like, okay, it's great that there are more people who want to do this work and look and question and self-reflect. And But there's a whole host of people who don't want to. And that's what, as a human being, just living in this world and where that's go. So I'm, I'm taking it somewhere else. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah. It makes me think about, um, it makes me think two things. One is thinking about um, Resma Menekem's work and my grandmother's hands and just this white body supremacy, like how that lives in our bodies and our tissues. That's the intergenerational trauma that, you know, white people have had for a long time in addition to, to BIPOC individuals. But it also makes me think that when I think of white people who are maybe um, like indifferent or, or have apathy, um, that so much of that, right, is they're connected to other people, right? So like to me, it's how do white people call other white people in, right? So it's yeah. like, you know, if you have family members who don't see this, who, who don't believe in it, it's like how do you over time continue to invite them in to conversation, share books you're reading, things you're watching, bring them somewhere, a play, a restaurant, something that I think there's like the urgency, right? Like we have to fix, you know, 400, 500 years of racism in one year, right? Versus like, what if we spent several years, the rest of our lifetime, inviting people in, right? And and that that could be exhausting for white people, but that could be your form of reparation, right? Is that I'm going to show up over and over and over again for the rest of my life. I'm going to teach my kids and my clients and, and like over time, you get more and more people, right? It's just kind of like when there was a civil war, right? There was a whole part of the United States that said, no, we still want to enslave black people. Um, but like, we don't need all the white people to get it. We just need enough to not get in the way so that, you know, we can build more equity and we can have more BIPOC people in leadership positions. And then we can start to change some of the policies that enslave people and, and cause people to die at really young ages, all of that stuff. So like, I think, I think of it at like concentric circles, like the people who are like actively challenging racist, like the idea that racism exists, I just wish you well. Right, like there's really, I'm not even like gonna use energy to try to chat with you about stuff. Like, um, but there are other people who are just uninformed, uneducated, have lived segregated lives, and with some nurturing could be really great allies. And I'm gonna put more of my energy there. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being a good ally to us and on our in our work, because I, I do yeah. see that it's like. It is a, it's not, racism is not a black person's problem to fix. And, and I see, you know, the leaders in this movement are mostly black women. And, you know, I'm really grateful for it and for the, the ability to have the capacity for you to be here, you know, and to do what you do every day. So thank you for that. Thank you, Carrie, that was beautifully put. Um, ladies. We can't thank you enough, but we have successfully, tech problems aside, <laughs> pulled off our 50th episode, believe it or not. So at the end, thank you. at the end, thank you. And with a beautiful, powerful conversation with beautiful women, I'm so excited. But at the end of every, every episode, we have the last hurrah and Anisha's is up. She's got some questions for you guys that might not make you that uncomfortable. So we're going to see. It's just one they question. Might. They could be very, they could be very, <laughs> they could be very, very personal. We don't know. We never know. Go on. So it's been so much talk about quarantine purchases. Um, what is your favorite <laughs> item that you bought this year? 
and we'll go around. What's the favorite item that you guys bought this year during the pandemic? While we've been trying to make ourselves more comfortable at home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I bought the Dyson um, blow dryer. Uh huh. You know oh, you Dyson? did? I did. <laughs> I, really I am. I am. <laughs> that's that's a decadent purchase, my friends. And I have to say, just today, I saw in my hair dryer when I was getting ready for this event because I had to do the whole thing. I was like, oh, there's a little flicker of a flame. I'm gonna have to get a blow dryer before this is over. I got Dyson and Dry Bar on my list. Excellent. Okay, go on. <laughs> Who else? Lyrica, what would you buy? I got a I got a hammock and installed it on my balcony. And that even though I can't use it right now, it's winter. <laughs> but, um, I really miss it. And I think that was probably the best purchase because it's amazing. Nice. Also an excellent purchase. And there's a balcony. We're all coming to visit. I mean, I all I want is outdoor space. That's City it. people can have space. hammocks too. Thank you for yeah. that. Exactly. Yeah, I love that. Yeah love that okay we got two more what do we got dr natalie yeah i'm I'm trying to think i was like i don't feel like i had like big purchases it took me a while and then i was like okay i, I bought myself a coach purse and an air fryer Ooh. i would say those are the two things and i am just <laughs> loving my air fryer i mean it's just i heard people talking about it but i was like What's the big deal? I don't want one more contraption. <laughs> but this thing, oh my right? God. Like my husband is like, oh, we're using it again? Oh. And then all of a sudden he's like, oh, this is delightful. The, oh, I'm so, oh my goodness. More ideas. Yeah, we got, we got a juicer. It was a bad idea. We used it like for a week. It was like, <laughs> ju like it wasn't even me. Like he was like, I'm going to juice. And he juiced for a week. And the other day I put like a bowl of fruit out. I was like, here, babe. Nope. He like took two pieces of fruit and left. I was like, I thought you were going to juice for me like every day until we went back to work. No. That's so wait, happen. Dr. Air Natalie, fryer. I have to send you this guy on Instagram. His Instagram is all about him and his air fryer. It's all the things that he makes with the air fryer. It's super cool. I got to send it, it to you. You'll love oh, it. I believe it. I believe it. Give you some good ideas. Oh, yeah. Oh, the air fryer. Yeah. And one more well, gadget. My sister told me okay. about the air fryer. So now that's the university to me. I got the air fryer. Got the air fryer. Okay, but what'd you buy? Oh, God. What didn't we buy? I made my electronics <laughs> and I was like, crap into my Amazon car all the time. I go to Amazon to buy like filters for the turtle pin, and there's like 30 things in the Amazon. What the hell are you doing? Um, God, what? Unfortunately, anything that can keep that has kept our kids occupied. We bought like a pop up in tech pool for the summer that I knew and I. I was all. just going to say, you got a pool, right? And then that was it. Down. That was fun. Um, you know, God, I'm just talking to anything, honestly, anything for the kids that gives them some sort of joy and activity and get them away from the screen. Great. Okay. I'm into it. All right. Well, I. I have to say, I'm glad I didn't hear anybody got a quarantine puppy. Did anybody get a quarantine puppy? Because oh. I'm going to tell you that my dog is never going to be left alone. The, so it's the anxiety, the attachment oh. disorder that has been created in my dog. I'm surprised. You know, I was at the I was at the farmers market the other day, and I saw like ten people struggling with their new dogs. Like if you look around the city, everybody is struggling. The dog, there's a dog that won't walk. There's a dog that's like doing crazy stuff. Like things oh, are yeah. people are struggling with their dogs. It's so funny. Oh. Dog trainers are busy, busy right now. Busy. Yep. The yeah, dog trainer that <laughs> I use to try to get my dog to stop barking at the TV, which didn't work. Anyway, I see her now with a different dog like every day, like sometimes twice a day. <laughs> She's yeah. like, she is so busy. Well, ladies, um, again, thank you so much. And Anisha, 50th episode. We are what? Wow. Still living a pandemic. And yes. um, wow. Mm -hmm. You ready to close it out? Unbelievable. You guys are Let's, amazing. Thank you. So how thank do we close you. this out, Diana? Um, stay safe. Stay safe. Wash, Wash your, your hands. hands. And, and wear, wear your damn mask. Wear the damn mask, people. <laughs> wear the damn mask so we can go outside. 
<laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And All right. we're going to stop you. here and everything will be in the show notes and you guys will hear from us Thank again. you everyone thank for you. listening, for being Bye. here. Bye. 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 I don't know how. What do we do? <laughs> I'm going to end it. Okay. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs>